And tonight we're going to look at a, a group that some cult researchers do not classify as a cult, and other ones do. And it is uh, as large or larger than anything else we've already looked at. And it's a, um, it's a, a Christian denomination known as the Church of Christ. I'm sure you all have heard of it. There's one or two here in Springfield. And uh, so we're going to give an overview of it, some of the facts, and specifically certain um, errors, and then come to the conclusion, is it in fact a um, cult or just another denomination? It's called the Church of Christ, or in the plural, the Churches of Christ. We're not talking about the United Church of Christ. That is a congregational denomination that is extremely liberal. This group is extremely conservative. Nor are we talking about the International Church of Christ, which is another cult. I think it's based in Boston. And uh, other groups that use that term. But this is the one that is usually the local church is called the Church of Christ. And uh, as a group, they're called the Churches of Christ. Now, because of the nature of their organization, it's hard to get accurate statistics. But researchers usually estimate about two million members in their various branches in the United States perhaps as many as 17,000 congregations. So we're not talking about a little tiny group. Last week, uh, we talked about the Unification Church. No more than just a, you know, 10 or 20,000. So we're talking about something much, much larger here. It's uh, predominant in the United States, but it's also spread overseas. And in the United States, it's mainly in the South. They give uh, great emphasis to their name, the Church of Christ. In fact, their literature sometimes says, well, we're the church that you find discussed in the New Testament. And uh, they particularly appeal to Romans 6.16, 6, where the phrase Churches of Christ is found. They say, that's it. No church is a true church unless it uses the Bible name. And this is the Bible name, therefore that's us. But there's also a church on Stevenson Drive that calls itself the Church of God. And that's a phrase found in the New Testament as well. And uh, then there's the Assembly of God, which would be another translation of the word for church. Um, And so, well, which one? Does it have to have the accurate name to be the accurate church? Not really. Uh, Paul was not giving it a name per se, like you name a child and from then on that's his name. He was giving a description. Um, There's the Church of God, the Church of Christ, and so forth. So let's don't put great emphasis on that name, but they do. And we'll see why in just a few minutes. Now, there are various branches, but there's a remarkable uniformity among them on the doctrines that we're going to be looking at. Um, Some of the moderate ones in this movement are actually into the charismatic movement. And um, but there's no central denominational office per se. What binds them together is their unified, similar views and a number of. Leading churches that put out magazines that go all around, and it's like if you're on the up and up, they'll mention you in the magazine, and if you're not, well, they'll separate. But there's no denominational office per se. Um, nevertheless, they do uh, cooperate in a number of ventures, like publishing houses and uh, some 21 colleges and universities, such as Abilene Christian College down in Texas. Uh, the prestigious Pepperdine University out in Los Angeles, and Harding University down in Arkansas, among other ones as well. Uh, Occasionally, uh, uh, one of their preachers becomes well-known. In the last 10 or 20 years, probably the most well-known one is Max Licato, and he's in this group. But relatively recently, he changed the name of his church, and he's kind of moving out of this circle. And uh, he he was about as moderate a member of this group as you could get. He wasn't a hard liner. Where did it come from? It started in the early 1800s in uh, the United States when several uh, uh, preachers from different backgrounds found that they had the same vision. And they said, we need to rediscover Bible Christianity and a way of of, um, preaching and worshiping. And so... um, the movement became known as the Restoration Movement. They're restoring the New Testament church. Not Reformation, Restoration. They usually didn't recognize the Protestant Reformation. The leaders were uh, James O'Kelly, and with a name like that, obviously of Irish descent, he was a Methodist from Virginia. There was Abner Jones and Elias Smith, who were Baptists from New England. 
Barton Stone, a Presbyterian from Kentucky, and then the father and son team of Thomas and Alexander Campbell, uh, who were Presbyterians from West Virginia. There were lesser leaders such as Walter Scott and one Raccoon John Smith. I like that name, Raccoon John Smith. Um, and what they wanted to do was to um, get back to true Christianity and true unity. They said, Bible knows nothing about denominations, Presbyterian, Methodist, Catholic. There are no denominations in the Bible. And they said there are many Christians in all different churches, so we need to tear down the structures that divide Christians. So far, kind of good. Um, but in time, you saw what their real agenda was. For example, they were uh, very strongly against Calvinism from the very beginning. And uh, other emphases began to come up. Um, the movement began to grow in the um, 1800s, and then a major division happened in 1906. Uh, just like in any group, you're going to have the right wing and the left wing. The ultra-conservatives, the ultra-liberal, the spectrum will, will develop like the colors of a rainbow. And so what happened in 1906, uh, there was a split. And uh, the more left-wing branch was known as the Disciples of Christ. And the more right-wing branch... Uh, continued with the name Church of Christ. Now, sometimes these words are used synonymously, uh, but you do need to know that uh, these are the two branches, and uh, the Disciples of Christ continues today and has continued to go more to the left, and uh, the other one has continued to go more to the right. Uh, later on, uh, there was yet another split. By the way, there are a lot of little splinter, splinter groups, but later in the 20th century, there was a split mainly in the group that called itself the Disciples of Christ, parenthesis, Christian Church. And uh, so again, you had the more conservative and the more liberal. The more liberal continued to use the term Disciples of Christ, uh, whereas the more moderate branch uh, generally calls itself the Christian Church. And that's what our church once was uh, many, many years ago. It came out of that movement. Um, with Stewart Street Christian Church and then Christian Bible Church. Um, but then um, I've heard that it was Pastor Finley and other ones say Pastor McGarvey that basically cut the rope in the ties between our church and the Christian Church. McGarvey, okay. Uh, whereas the Disciples of Christ, that is liberal. But yet, these all three branches of the Restoration Movement still have certain things in common, specifically their view of uh, baptism, which we're going to look at in a few minutes. Sometimes the um, members of the Restoration Movement in all three branches are called Campbellites, um, a term that they do not use for themselves, and sometimes the term is used in a derogatory sense. But it's not necessarily derogatory because uh, there are people that call themselves Lutherans and Wesleyans, Calvinists. And that's not necessarily uh, um, you know, derogatory, <coughs> but it's a term they don't generally use of themselves. But uh, of those initial founders, Alexander Campbell really stood out head and shoulders above the other ones. So it could be called a movement of Campbellism. Um, yeah. And I learned never trust anybody with the name Campbell. Right, Laura? Yeah, <laughs> sheep stealers, yeah. They make good soup, but not good denominations. But they don't consider Alexander Campbell inspired or infallible or a prophet. Um, they kind of look to him somewhat like the Lutherans do to Luther, but not like the Mormons look to Joseph Smith or some of these other denominations look to their, their founders. Um, what's special about them? Well, his father, Thomas Campbell, came to America from Northern Ireland of Scotch-Irish Presbyterian descent. And then later his son came, and uh, they were probably the prime movers in the Restoration Movement. And uh, at the time, being Presbyterians, they believed in infant baptism. Then they began to re-examine it and said, no, it's, it's not in the Bible. It's believer's baptism. And then they changed to immersion um, believer's baptism. And so Alexander saw that uh, he had not been immersed as a believer, so he uh, got a hold of a Baptist pastor and was baptized with his parents, his wife, his sister, and two friends of his. At that point, however, according to the research, he still didn't consider baptism essential for salvation. But he was going from infant baptism to believer's baptism, but 
Then he gradually moved into the view that baptism is essential for salvation. Order 2 is in order now on their view of um, ecclesiology. The movement began as an effort to unite evangelical believers in different uh, churches, uh, but something went wrong somewhere along the line. It started off somewhat ecumenical and now is extremely uh, anti-ecumenical, and it's become one of the most exclusive groups that calls itself Christian. Um, In effect, the Church of Christ has become a denomination, although they say there are no denominations. And they'll say they're not a denomination. They say they don't have a headquarters, they don't have bishops. And uh, they don't have a creed and so forth. Nevertheless, they still see that they are a movement. And they use that term, Church of Christ. And I will say, go to the dictionary and look up the term denomination. And that means something that is denominated. It is something that is named. And so you could say in the precise linguistic sense of the term, yes, they are denomination. As long as they insist on, you've got to be named Church of Christ. Uh, but it is a denomination, and they, there might be a moderate and liberal branch of it, but the Church of Christ is a denomination. Um, also, they have a, um, another mark of their ecclesiology. Uh, virtually all of their people are amillennial, and so they say the Church is the kingdom of God. But then that leads, and that's, there's a lot of truth in that, but they go beyond the pale when they kind of, dip, they don't make the distinction between the visible local church and the invisible church. Now, that was a Protestant differentiation. The Catholics say, no, no, the Catholic church is visible. We are the invisible church, one and the same. Um, a church goes, gets into muddy water when it says there is no difference, and that's us. That's tantamount to saying we are the only true church. Uh, we would say that there are true believers in many other denominations, uh, not just our local church, but there will be Baptists, Presbyterians, and Methodists and Pentecostals that are believers, but it's not limited to any one church or any any one denomination. But the Church of Christ tends to say in its literature, they are the Church of Christ. They are the one that is the one mentioned in the Bible, they and no other. And um, that strongly implies in their literature, they consider themselves not only the only true church, but if you're not part of them, you're not a true Christian. Uh, That figures into their view of salvation, that to be saved you have to keep your salvation. And one of the means of maintaining your salvation is you've got to be a member of the true church, the church of Christ. And so if you're outside of that, you'll dry up, kind of like excommunication from the Catholic Church. You lose your salvation. And yet they don't have an authoritative creed or confession or catechism. And they often will say, well, there's no creed but Christ. Another slogan that they like to use is, um, where the scriptures speak, we speak. Where the scriptures are silent, we are silent. And so they say, only the explicit statements in scripture are binding, and uh, we don't have to do systematic theology and deduce things. If it's not explicitly said, then we don't have to explicitly believe in it. Um, There are weaknesses in that position because we see that the apostles themselves took various statements from the Old Testament and from that deduced certain truths. They were implicit, but not explicit. But this group tends to say, if it's not explicit, it's not true, we don't have to believe in it. Lastly, on the ecclesiology, virtually all of their churches sing a cappella, non-instrumental. I've heard that there are a few that may bring in instruments, but this is another thing that they uh, they tend to emphasize, that it's got to be sung uh, without musical instruments. And they say that's a marker of carnality and worldliness and so forth. Um, Well, if you don't want to use instruments, you don't have to, but I wonder what they do with Psalm 150 and all the instruments there. Of course, that would be Old Testament, and from the literature I've read, they tend to de-emphasize and minimize the Old Testament and practically ignore it. Other ones would say, well, that's Old Testament, we're in the New Covenant, so that doesn't apply to us, so just... Be quiet. Next, and here's where we begin to look at the uh, significant errors, is, um, is when it comes to salvation. As we saw this morning, uh, Paul warns us, to, tells us, uh, Jude tells us to contend earnestly for the faith, the gospel, the essentials of salvation. What are their, what's their view of uh, salvation? They have repeatedly stressed that there are four steps to salvation, and they have to be done in the proper order. Faith, repentance, Uh, Public confession, 
that is confession of sin, of, uh, of faith, and then water baptism. And they say that's the, uh, the four links in the chain, and without those four in that order, there's no salvation. Some of them add a fifth step, and this actually does figure into their theology, uh, perseverance. Now, they don't believe in the perseverance of the saints like Calvinists do, but they say that you, know, you, you believe, you repent, you publicly profess Christ, you get baptized, but you can lose it. These are hyper-Arminians. They are very strongly Arminian. In fact, all three branches are very Arminian. And so they, uh, they lay a, a strong emphasis on you've got to keep up your salvation or you'll lose it. You, you've got to maintain it. Consequently, they tend to it sound like works righteousness contributes to salvation. And they tend to be legalistic in, in many other areas. Nevertheless, let me say a few things about their four steps of salvation. There's nothing wrong with requiring faith and repentance because the Bible repeatedly says that. Sometimes it says believe, sometimes it says repent, and at least two times it says believe and repent. Uh, Mark 1 and Acts 20. So there's no problem there. But what about these next two? What about the necessity of public confession? Um, they say that's as, as, as essential as faith and repentance. And they would say it's really an expression of your faith. If you truly believe, you will express it. If you don't express it, that shows you don't have true faith. It's as simple as that. Um, Alexander Campbell described this step in terms of the verbal confession before witnesses that uh, Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And uh, so a lot of their church meetings culminate in an altar call to come forward, repent, believe, and have a public confession, and then get in the tank and be immersed in water. They base their views on uh, Matthew 10, 32 and 33, Romans 10, 9 and 10, Psalm 107, 2, and a few other verses. However, I don't think those verses are saying what they are saying. When Jesus said, he that uh, confesses me publicly, I'll confess publicly. But that can be disordered like Billy Graham does and says, and says, well, that's teaching the altar call. It's not teaching the altar call. Nor is Jesus saying you have got to stand in front of a church and verbally say, I believe in Jesus. And if you don't, you're not saved. I don't think that's what he's saying. I think what he's saying is that if you, if you don't confess him, if you're not willing to follow him, that shows you're not really following him. Um, but they're distorting that. Romans 10, you know, it says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus... Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You shall be saved. And they say, that's it. You, that faith isn't good enough. You have to have the expression of it. And without that, you won't be saved. Psalm 107.2, I think that's where it says, you know, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. If you don't say so, then you're not redeemed. I think these verses are talking about the ideal expression of faith, but not the essential nature of a public confession. They make it almost like the word of faith movement that says, you speak the word of faith and it's something miraculous happens to change circumstance or create a miracle or something. Now they kind of bring in something like this, that the faith and the repentance is not good enough. It's kind of like a baby that's in the womb that needs to come out. And if it doesn't come out, it can be aborted or miscarried, in, in, in which uh, case you don't have a baby. And no birth. So they'd say, well, if the faith and the uh, repentance isn't expressed, Excuse me, about to sneeze. They say if it's not expressed, it's like an abortion. In fact, there's some of them have used language like that. They say it's like a miscarriage, and so the baby's not fully born. It, was, it began, but it stopped. Um, this system, in effect, denies that a person can be saved all along. I was saved with a guy that wasn't even a Christian, but they said, Did you publicly confess Christ with your mouth? Um, well, I think I did to him, but that's not what saved me. But they was. In effect, say, if you're by yourself and you repent and believe, but you don't tell anybody, it doesn't mean anything. The baby hasn't come forth. You haven't really been saved. That's the problem with saying these are steps of salvation. The public confession is absolutely essential. Now, that's somewhat similar to the Roman Catholic idea that the church is the necessary dispenser of grace because they emphasize it's got to be done in one of their churches. Now, the real argument, and the one we're going to give most attention to now, is their fourth step of salvation. The one that they emphasize, this is the one that really seals it, baptism. Uh, the question we would ask them is, is baptism essential for salvation? Is it a sine qua non? Anybody know what those three Latin words mean? That without which. Uh, is it that without which there cannot be salvation? Is it essential? Is it 
Uh, is it necessary? Well, what do they say? Let me just quote some of their own leaders. Uh, quote, baptism is essential to salvation. Another one, baptism is a condition precedent to receiving salvation from God's hand. Shout it from the rooftops. Man must be baptized in order to be saved. Another one, before one is baptized, he is outside of Christ. After he is baptized, he is in Christ. And Alexander Campbell himself said, we connect faith with immersion as essential to forgiveness. Now, early in his ministry, Campbell wavered. He started off not believing that, and gradually he did, so you can get quotations from various stages, but he came to the point of basically saying, without baptism, no salvation. Here's another quote. Alexander Campbell, baptism without faith is of no value whatsoever. But then he'd say, faith without baptism is of no value whatsoever either. He's not saying that you baptize somebody, that's all that matters. That's not what he's saying. He's saying you've got to have the faith, repentance, public confession, which usually happens at the time of the baptism. So without the faith and repentance, the baptism doesn't do anything. But they also say, since these are four necessary stages, without, without baptism, faith is of, of no good. The baby hasn't come forth yet. It hasn't been born. Now, they are not like other groups that teach another form of baptismal regeneration or baptismal salvation, like the Church of England and, uh, and the Roman Catholic Church. Those groups kind of get it the other way around. They say, you start with baptism with infants. And then as the child grows up, maybe it gradually develops faith, but it's regenerated in its infancy by virtue of the saving power of, of, of the water. But then it's baptism, and then gradually it grows into faith and repentance, and then it's confirmed, usually around 11 or 12, and that's when he makes a public confession. The Church of Christ says, no, you've got it all backwards. But they all agree that these are necessary steps of salvation. Now, I'm not going to look into the infant Baptist view of, um, uh, of baptismal regeneration, because that's not in view here. But what they say is that faith, repentance, confession, uh, publicly... Uh, will not result in salvation unless it's culminated in baptism. And they are very explicit and emphatic in this. Um, one of their leaders wrote this, Faith alone will result in spiritual abortion if not followed by scriptural water baptism. And Alexander Campbell said, No person was said to be converted until he was immersed, and that all persons who were immersed were said to be converted. Now, other branches of the Reformation, the Restoration Movement might, you know, hedge and rephrase all this. This movement is usually very explicit on this. Um, they will use phrases like, um, you meet the blood of Christ in the waters of baptism and nowhere else. Uh, so what exactly happens at baptism? Alexander Campbell listed several things that occur at the point of water baptism. Adoption, justification. Sanctification in the positional sense, reconciliation, salvation, pardon, regeneration, remission of sins, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. All that happens at the moment uh, that a person uh, who has already repented, believed, and confessed Christ, now, when he is in the waters, this is what happens to him, all in one fell swoop. They'll say, you meet the blood of Christ in the waters of baptism, and Alexander Campbell said, quote, Certainly water can wash away sins. There is, then, a transferring of the efficacy of blood to water. Let me repeat that. He says, certainly water can wash away sins. There is, then, a transferring of the efficacy of blood to water. So when we say, no, no, the Bible says the blood of Christ washes away sins. First John 1, 7 and many other such verses, they say, that's right, the blood of Christ does it. But the efficacy, the miraculous nature of that, has been transferred to water. Some of them would say, well, the blood of Christ is in heaven with his ascended glorified body. But he has transferred, this sounds kind of like Roman Catholicism, but the miraculous efficacy of that has been transferred into this water. They usually don't use terms like holy water, but in effect, it's the same Catholic idea. There's something magical about the water. And I use the word magical very literally here. Um, Campbell also explained that in the book of Revelation, it says our garments are washed by blood. So he says, well, in the same way, our sins are washed by water. And uh, at the point of baptism, quote, he thus formally receives what was at first received by faith in anticipation. And their system says you have faith, but it's in anticipation of salvation that's given when you are 
actually baptized. So they emphasize that at that ordinance of baptism, something is actually given miraculously, not just simply symbolized about what has already been given. Something is actually bestowed in the waters. What about those that are not baptized? Well, um, here's where Campbell wavered, as I said, quote, uh, he said, quote, I cannot treat every unimmersed person as a pagan. But then later he began to retract that. And um, so they would say that, no, if you're not if you're not immersed, uh, then you're just not saved. That's the means of of God granting uh, the miracle of salvation. Um, uh, some of their literature, though, gets paints them into a corner. Uh, for example, they say you can lose your salvation. Well, how do you get it back? If the four steps of salvation are uh, the faith, repentance, public confession, and baptism, you would think that they would say if you lose it, you have to go back to those four steps. And although some of their churches practice rebaptism, other churches, or some of their literature at least, says no, no, no. If um, if you lose salvation, go back and repent and believe and make a public confession of that, and that will do. Well, wait a second, if baptism was essential to get salvation in the first place and then you lose it all, logically you'd have to get baptized again. And some of the churches see the logic and consistency, other ones do not. Um, lost my place. Um, some of them also hedge. This is what you find more in the Christian church, where they'll say, well, it's the intent that matters. Now, these churches, usually they give the altar call and they say, now, uh, you, you, you repent, you believe, yes. Okay, you will, are you willing to make a public profession to be baptized? Yes. They want you to get, get you into the tank immediately because what happens if you, know, you get in a car accident and, and die on the way to the church? I'd like to press them and say, well, what about that person? He can't go to hell because he's a believer, but he can't go to heaven because, according to your system, he hasn't been baptized. They don't like to be put into such a situation, so they want to get you into the tank very quickly. But then um, I would say, what about that person that dies? He's repented, he's believed. According to the Bible, he's saved. So the Church of Christ usually would say, no, he's not saved. Whereas the other ones would say, well, if he intended to be baptized, baptism intent, of intent is sufficient. But if he didn't intend to, that shows that he really wasn't a believer. So uh, he's disqualified. I've heard those, uh, that logic of hedging. So when they say baptism of intent, by the way, that's a concept borrowed directly from Roman Catholicism. Baptism of intent. But still comes down to, they say, it's the water that is the final thing. Church of Christ is very explicitly on that. Um, so another other leader said this. The unbaptized person capable of being baptized is unsaved. The unbaptized are not in Christ. So I don't want to labor the point. Obviously, they labor it enough. It's, it's explicit enough. Let's briefly look at some of their biblical, um, uh, their attempts to support it biblically. And they have four or five major verses. You can open with me if you'd like. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. You know, I've actually seen t-shirts and ads with this on there, basically saying this is salvation. Acts 2.38 day of Pentecost, people speaking in tongues, Peter stands up to preach, tongues weren't sufficient to, so, to give the gospel, so he preaches, they said, what do we have to do to be saved? Verse, um, what do we have to do? Verse 38, Peter said to them, repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is their favorite verse, and they say, there you have it in black and white, where scriptures speak, we speak. And they say, uh, faith is assumed when it mentions repentance, and Peter's asking him to be baptized, and baptism assumes public confession, but they say, here you have it. Repentance is not enough. Faith isn't enough. You've got to be baptized, and they say, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for, to get the remission of sins and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Looks like that, but they're wrong. You could even notice that that's not what the English says, let alone the Greek. Um, there are a number of notable leading Greek scholars, such as uh, A.T. Robertson, 
Dana and Manti, Nigel Turner and other ones that have exegeted this in lengthy discussions and said, that's not what the Greek is saying when it says uh, baptized for the remission of sins. In other words, be baptized in order to get the remission of sins. Uh, when I was researching this again, I, one of them pointed this out. They said, if I'm going to get technical, well, just bear with me. It's the prerogative of a preacher to get technical. It says there's the command, repent, and then it uses the preposition. You know, preposition is one of those short words like in, with, under, around, near. You know, it's, it's a transitional word. And so the transitional word here is ace, E-I-S, in English. And one of them said, it's not henna, I-N-A, uh, iota, nu, uh, alpha. Uh, it, henna means with a view to or in order to get something. And that's what the word would have been if that's what this verse was teaching. Instead, he uses ace. Ace is a very general word that can be used in a variety of ways. And one such very common use of ace is not in order to get something, but not looking forward, but looking back because of something. So A.T. Robertson paraphrases this. He was a Baptist scholar and in his day was the leading Greek scholar in the whole world. And he says this probably should be rendered something like uh, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ because of the, the forgiveness of sins you have already received. So the order is you repent, you receive forgiveness, and then you're baptized. That is an important difference. So it's that baptism follows the repentance. And when is the forgiveness given? At the moment of repentance, not at the moment of baptism. You say, can you give me any parallels? Let me show you two parallels using the same Greek construction over in the book of Matthew. First turn to Matthew 3, 11. We'll give a little bit more attention to Acts 2.38 than some of the other verses, because that's a major one, but we will bring in some of the other ones. Look at Matthew 3. Here's John the Baptist. Look at uh, verse 11. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. Same words. Ace. But wait a second. Everything you read about John in all four Gospels, he required repentance before baptism. So he's saying, I baptize you with water. Ace uh, metanoia. Uh, baptism unto repentance. That is, because of your repentance. No repentance, he wasn't going to baptize you. So what he's saying is, I am baptizing you with water because of your repentance. He turned away people that didn't uh, baptize, or didn't repent. You see what, what it's saying here, the same construction. Repentance must precede um, the baptism, and that uh, the baptism is not what saves, it's the repentance. Let me show you another thing in Matthew uh, chapter 12. It all hinges upon... Is that verse in, in, in Acts 2.38 looking forward to the forgiveness of sins after baptism? Or is it looking back? And here's another good one. Uh, Matthew 12.41. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. He said, I don't see it. Where is it? It's in that middle clause. They repented, ace, the preaching of Jonah. They didn't repent in order to hear the preaching of Jonah. They repented because of the preaching of Jonah. You see the order here. The order is very important. So again, I argue, and before you men and women of the jury, that um, Acts 2.38 is, is, should be rendered, repent and be baptized because of the forgiveness of sins, not in order to receive. The forgiveness of sins. Now, I said also, you know, you could argue this even on the basis of the English. And they said, well, there it is. Repent for, to get it. Wait a second. Word for is another one of those words that can be used in a variety of ways. You know that I'm writing to some of these prison inmates. And I say, what are you in for? And they say, I went to prison for my crime. Did they go to prison to get a crime? They're in prison because of a crime that's already happened. So the word for means... Because of something that's already happened, not in order to get something. And I argue, uh, I hope conclusively, that that's what you see in Acts 2.38. Okay, let's... Um
Move on to another one. Mark 16:16. 16, 16. Remember arguing with one of their evangelists about this many years ago, and he says, "I said this is conclusive." By the way, he started by saying it was Matthew chapter 16. I let him have enough rope. He kept saying, Matthew 16 says this. I said, you sure it's Matthew, not Mark? No, no, no. I said, you sure it's not Luke? It's Matthew. And I said, no, I think you, I opened this up. I said, I think your verse is in Mark 16. And anyway, a little humorous. Mark 16, 16. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. They say, there you have it. Where scripture speak, we speak. It's explicit. We can close our Bibles and go home. Baptism is essential to is is an essential part of the Great Commission. We preach the gospel. We must state that baptism is as essential as faith. And only baptized believers are saved. The unbaptized are lost. That's how they argue from this verse. Wait a second. Bad logic. It does say he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Um, but Jesus also goes on to say he who does not believe will not be condemned. You notice he gives it in the positive, then he gives the reverse. The reverse does not say, he that is not baptized will not be saved. Why did Jesus leave that out? Because he did not believe that unbaptized people are not saved. The emphasis is on the faith, and of course the order is believe and then be baptized. And so there's, a, there's, a, there's an illogic here. By the way, you can see uh, similar phrases in the Bible where it says something and then it turns it around and says, without this. He that has the Son has life. He that does not have the Son does not have life. But it says here, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. But it does not say he that does not believe and nor is baptized. Or that believes but is not baptized will not be saved. It doesn't say that. So I think they're stretching at something. And they say, but when the Scriptures don't speak, we don't speak. The Scriptures don't speak what they're saying. It's so they would probably do well, as they say in Scotland, to hold your wish, laddie. Which is a Scottish way of saying be quiet. <laughs> Uh, they're trying to make it say something. It does not say. What it does say is that unbelievers will be condemned. It doesn't say unbaptized will be condemned. Next, for time's sake, I'll just allude to these verses. Romans 6, 3-5 and Galatians 3:27 talks about being baptized into Christ. And they say that's it. That's how we're put into Christ. And without being put into Christ, there's no salvation. And so baptism is the one. But... They, 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 they make an error. There's some evangelicals that say, well, this is, it uses the word baptizing, but uh, water baptism symbolizes what's happening here. But again, that's a, a little jumble. Let me, let me cut to the chase on this. Not every time you see the word baptize is water in view. There's several places where it talks about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Let's don't automatically jump and see that word baptized and say it automatically means water. The necessity, what the word means is to immerse, to dip, to plunge. And so when it says we are immersed or we are baptized in the Greek, that doesn't necessarily mean with water. And I'm convinced in those two places and several other ones like 1 Corinthians 12, 13, it's not talking about water baptism, but a spiritual baptism. We are baptized into Christ by the Spirit, not by water. It's a spiritual transition or transaction, not a watery one, not a physical one. And so to automatically see that where the word baptized is, is automatically water, is an unnecessary linguistic assumption. And uh, people say, well, why do you use the word? Because the basic meaning wasn't talking about water, but was talking about uh, plunging so that you're into something and now that's your realm of being. So to paraphrase what these verses are saying, it's like saying you were plunged into Christ with the result. Now you're in Christ. It's not talking about water. Water is not the element. It's a spiritual fact. The Holy Spirit putting us into Christ. Next, turn to John chapter 3. This is another one of their favorite verses that they suppose teaches the necessity of water baptism. John 3, 5, Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So they contend that Jesus lays down water baptism as an essential ingredient with regeneration by the Spirit in order to enter heaven. And so they, some, some of them will say, well, the water here is talking about the baptism of John the Baptist. In the next chapter it says, well, Jesus himself didn't baptize, but his apostles did, and so did John the Baptist. So they said, well, that's it. Uh, Nicodemus, uh, 
uh, had heard about the baptism of John, and Jesus was saying, well, that's right. Um, you have to be baptized with water. Unless you're baptized with water, you cannot see the kingdom of God. That's how you're born again, um, and to be born of the Spirit. It happens simultaneously. I'm not sure Nicodemus uh, knew much about John the Baptist, but I'm not going to argue one way or the other. But what does this verse mean? There are at least three major evangelical alternatives that escape the doctrine of baptismal salvation. Number one, there are those that uh, say that the word and could mean even. So it would mean something like unless one is born of water, even the spirit or that is the spirit, he cannot be born. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. They equate water in the spirit, not physical water, but water as a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Well, the Bible does uh, frequently, uh, even in the Gospel of John, chapter 7, talk about the Holy Spirit under the figure of water. Uh, in which case, um, this isn't talking about water baptism, but the Holy Spirit. Uh, there's something to be said to this, because sometimes that word and does mean that is or even. You see it back in John 1.12. However, that's a, definitely a minority view amongst evangelicals, a minority view of the word and. It might be correct, but I'm more inclined to say, no, that sounds, in hermeneutics we call that special pleading. It's like going for the minority instead of the majority. It's like, well, theoretically it's possible, but you better have more than that to make your case. Um, otherwise, you're in very um, shallow water. Sorry about the pun. No, I'm not sorry. Okay, the second alternative is it says that the word water here isn't referring to um, um, uh, waters of baptism, because baptism is never mentioned in this chapter. But they say that the word water is a symbol not for the Holy Spirit, but for the Word of God. And that there are a number of verses that talk about the water, about the Word of God as water. Ephesians 5.25, the washing of water of the Word. And so they say, well, that's what it means here. Problem is, that doesn't seem to fit the context either. Um, where it says, well, born of Water, that is, the Word of God and the Spirit. Well, why, didn't, why, why is there nothing else in here that's talking about the Word of God? There's no exegetical indicators that that's what water here means. I'm more inclined to go with the third view. I still have some reservations. But the third view says that uh, uh, the water here is not referring to baptism. It's not referring to the Holy Spirit or even to the Word of God. It's referring to the water of physical birth. Uh, the water that's in a... Uh, a mother's womb surrounding the baby, and so um, the baby is born of water when it when it when it emerges. And uh, uh, occasionally, the ancient Jews did use that language to describe birth. And uh, any mother, and most doctors will be able to tell, well, yeah, born of water. That's the baby coming out. Um, yeah, some would allude to John one thirteen for something similar to this. Uh, there are problems because uh, you say, well, the Jews occasionally use that sort of language, but not often. But in my opinion, what, what, what gives this interpretation most credence is context. Context is one of the three or four major points in interpreting something. For example, is anything said in here about the Word of God or the Holy Spirit being the same? No, no. But you do find physical birth in this very same passage. When Jesus said this, uh, how did Nicodemus immediately respond? How did he understand that? Uh, verse 3 says, unless you were born again, you cannot see in the kingdom of God. Nicodemus starts thinking physical birth. Verse 4, can a man enter into his mother's womb again and be born when he is old? No. And so Jesus says, no, unless one is born of water and the spirit. Uh, and then he goes on back to verse 6. Born of the flesh is flesh, born of the spirit is spirit. So there's very much in the context here about contrasting physical birth and spiritual birth. I'm inclined to think that that's what Jesus means. What he is saying is something like this, if I can paraphrase it. Unless you were born of water physically, but also born spiritually, you can't make it. Nicodemus, you've already been born physically. You don't have to go and get that done again, man. But you do have to have the second one, which you don't have yet. That's the one that seems to me to fit the context best. And there's nothing in the context about water baptism. Uh, for time's sake, I'll just allude to 1 Peter 3.21, where words actually do or are used. Uh, water, uh, baptism doth now save us. But if you look at the context, 
he immediately qualifies that. First Peter one uh, three twenty one. Uh, Peter says, you know, he's talking about the symbolism of uh, Noah and the ark, and people were saved by getting on the ark and so forth. And he says, baptism now does save us. But then he immediately says, but it's not the putting away of filth on the body. And that's what happens when you're washed in water. He said, we're not talking about water baptism washing away sins. We're talking about, and he says, the answer of a good conscience, uh, the faith that you, that you have in believing. Um, let me also give a couple of other arguments and refutations of their position very briefly. I would direct them to the thief on the cross, that poor old thief. We don't even know the guy's name, but we'll meet him in heaven. He died without water baptism, and yet he was in paradise. Now, they would say, ah, that was old covenant. Uh, he died after Jesus. Jesus instituted the new covenant in his death. Um, other ones would say, well... This poor guy had already been baptized by John the Baptist. Where do they get that? That's not even in the New Geneva Study Bible. <laughs> That's out of thin air. Um, the point is that thief on the cross was saved because he believed in Jesus. He was not baptized. Uh, John Gill, the great Baptist theologian, said, The thief on the cross went to heaven without it, and Simon Magus went to hell with it. So baptism doesn't save. Simon Magus got baptized but had no faith. Here's a guy that had faith but no baptism. What's the key ingredient? Faith, not baptism. 1 Corinthians 1, Paul says that uh, Christ did not send him to baptize but to preach the gospel. Romans 4 explicitly addresses this and says that he was justified by faith before he was circumcised. And if before, therefore it was without it. He was already justified before. He said, well, I'd never seen that. Are you sure that's Romans 4? Caught the guy completely off guard. He didn't see the logic of it. Now, I'd also transfer that to the New Testament and say, if you want to argue that baptism takes the place of circumcision, you were saying that there's no, no salvation without circumcision. That's just what Paul was writing about in Galatians. Saying that here these people are saying, faith in Christ is good. It's essential, but it's not enough. You've got to be circumcised. I'd say... You were committing the same error by saying, well, instead of being circumcised, you have to be baptized. Being, believing in Christ is not enough. Repentance is not enough. You've got to be baptized. And they're adding works to salvation. Therefore, it comes under the condemnation of Galatians. They're preaching a false gospel. In Acts 15, uh, the uh, Jerusalem Council, the apostles, said that these heretics were preaching a false gospel because they were saying, unless you are circumcised, you cannot be saved. The same thing is being said by people today. Unless you are baptized, you cannot be saved. It's as explicit as for that. The biblical order is you repent and believe, and immediately, no time lag, you are saved at that very moment. And then you should show it by being baptized. You should want to. Some people get all jumbled up about this. They think that they were already baptized as a baby. Some have never heard of baptism. The point is, though, they are saved the moment they believe and repent. That's when salvation happens. And baptism uh, should follow that. By making it essential for salvation, they're adding to the conditions of the gospel and therefore preaching another gospel. Uh, one last thing is I would direct them to Acts 10, Cornelius. Uh, it says he believed and he was saved and he wasn't baptized. He'd never even heard of baptism probably. And so Peter says, well, let's get some water in. Not to seal that they were saved, but to show that they had been saved already. Is the Church of Christ a cult? Some researchers say yes, and some say no. I would have to argue on the basis of this information tonight that they are. First, they tend to be highly exclusive. If you're not with them, you are not saved. That's what they tend to say in a variety of ways. They are the Church of Christ. But secondly, on their view of baptism. A person doesn't have to reject the whole gospel. Rejecting one link in the chain is enough. Of all the groups we've looked at, these are the ones that are closest to the truth, far closer than the Mormons or Unification Church. But if they add one condition to salvation, they fall into the condemnation of Galatians, it becomes a false gospel, therefore it cannot be considered an orthodox group. I'm not saying that all their people are false Christians. There probably are some true Christians in this group, just like there are true Christians in liberal churches. That doesn't mean that they should stay in that. They should leave it. But I would say that if they believe in this, just like someone that believes in the Roman Catholic view of salvation, 
or in the liberal Protestant view of salvation, or in the Mormon view of salvation. If that's what they are resting on, that shows that they are not saved, because you cannot be truly saved by a false system of salvation. And I'll leave it at that.